Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Cal McDonald, and I am the Sustainability Specialist with MCIC, and I will be co-hosting today, co today's event with my colleague, Lisa. Thank you, Kellen. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Orvec, and I'm the Education Specialist with MCIC. It's great to be here to recognize and celebrate the contributions of diverse organizations in this sector. Since 1991, each year at the start of February in Canada, the IDW Week, it's been an avenue to celebrate Canada's achievement in the international development sector. And this is what we're here to do today. This year's theme is Go for the Goals. We are excited to share some stories today of how our members and other Canadians are mobilizing in a way to achieve the sustainable development goals. We would like to acknowledge that MCIC and most of our staff are based in Winnipeg. This land is Treaty 1 territory and the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation. Winnipeg is located at the junction of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers and has been a meeting place for over 6,000 years. It is near the geographical center of Turtle Island, also known as North America. We are committed to becoming better stewards of this land and are committed to make every effort in reconciling with the Indigenous peoples whose land and water we benefit from today. We encourage you to reflect on the land you are joining us from today. Thank you, Callan. We want to give a quick rundown of today's activities. We will have MCIC Executive Director Janice Hamilton introduce you to MCIC and IDW. This will be followed by a message from Stuart Savage of Global Affairs Canada. He will then be join, joined by two MCIC members for a panel discussion. There are International Development Week events happening all across the country this week. Check out the Global Affairs event listings to participate in activities Canada-wide. Tomorrow, we will be hosting a virtual event called Reflections on Resilience, uh, featuring MCIC members who will discuss how they are making progress toward the Sustainable Development Goals. They will also touch on how pivots due to the pandemic brought about positive programming changes for their organizations. That will be happening at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. Uh, we also have our recently launched 2022 IDW book and documentary lists. You have the opportunity to win some amazing prizes with our book contest, so make sure to visit MCIC social channels or mcic.ca to get some more information. And with that, let's get going. So we have a couple of videos to show, including greetings from the Premier of Manitoba, the Honourable Heather Stephenson. Let's kick this off. Let's do that. Good afternoon, everyone. Our government is pleased to support the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation as we launch International Development Week this year. For over 30 years, International Development Week has celebrated the contributions of Canadians from coast to coast to coast in making our world a better place. I hope you will take this opportunity to get involved in international development education especially through the Student Reading Challenge, where you can learn more about the fight for equality of opportunity in our country and around the world. I also encourage you to get involved in the fight for the equal opportunity of women so that more women and girls can achieve careers in politics, public service, science, business, and medicine. It is critically important that all Canadians stay involved here at home and across the globe to make our world a better place for our children and grandchildren into the future. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. I wish all of you a happy and productive International Development Week. Thank you. Hello, I'm Janice Hamilton, and I have the privilege of working at the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation, and we are delighted that you're able to join us today to kick off International Development 2022. We are also thrilled to have greetings from the first woman Premier of Manitoba, the Honourable Heather Stephenson. 
MCIC was pleased to meet with the Premier two weeks ago to talk about the work that MCIC and its members are doing to create a just world. Now to tell you a little bit about MCIC. MCIC is a council of 44 registered charitable organizations involved in international development. In the past two years, we've had seven new organizations join MCIC. Our members range in size from small provincially based organizations such as People to People to very large organizations like World Vision and UNICEF. Some of our members are faith-based, while others are secular. A number of national organizations, such as Mennonite Central Committee, Canadian Lutheran World Relief, and IDE Canada, have their head offices in Manitoba. Our members are specialized, well-connected, and responsive. MCIC's members work with partners in Canada and around the world to achieve life-changing results for people wrestling with poverty and lack of opportunities. Manitobans are known for being generous when it comes to charitable donations, and this certainly extends to their support of international development organizations, both financially and through their volunteer time. Last year, our members raised over $29.5 million in Manitoba for their international development work. The government of Manitoba recognizes this, and for the past 46 years, they have contributed funds for our members' international development work. Last year, MCIC received 1.2 million that was passed on to our members and their local partners. In addition to supporting our members, MCIC also engages Manitobans on global issues. We appreciate the financial support we received from Global Affairs Canada for our inspiring action for Global Citizenship Program for our work with students, educators, and other Manitobans. Our Inspire team does a lot of work on the sustainable development goals throughout the province. For example, we have an SDG poster that has been sent to all schools in Manitoba that highlights the 17 goals and the 169 targets in both English and French. Our team have created many resources that can be used to go for the goals. International Development Week is an opportunity for the country to come together to showcase the amazing work that is being done every day. Global Affairs Canada is the federal department that is responsible for Canada's international development work. They work in partnership with many organizations to achieve results for development. MCIC is very pleased to be one of Global Affairs Canada's partners. I would now like to introduce Stuart Savage, Director General of Engaging Canadians at Global Affairs Canada. Stuart has worked in various roles for close to 30 years, and just prior to his current position, he was Canada's ambassador to Haiti. Stuart? Thank you so much for the invitation today. I'd just like to note that I'm calling in from Ottawa, which is the unceded territory of the Abishnabi people. Thank you again so much for this, this very kind invitation to involve me in this conversation in launching your International Development Week activities. The MCIC is one of our longstanding and, and great partners, and we're very grateful for the work that you do to help promote international development. International Development Week is, of course, an opportunity to celebrate the people of Canada who work in support of international development from coast to coast to coast, as the Premier said. Uh, and of course, over the this week, we have uh, activities going on across the country, panels, workshops, academic events, discussions like this, and all in the hope, I think, of informing, inspiring, and involving Canadians in international assistance. <clears throat> it's a great opportunity for all of us to share our stories and reaffirm our commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals. This year, uh, I think we can have the opportunity to reflect on how far we've come vis-a-vis -vis those goals, how we are all connected, and how the Sustainable Development Goals can guide us to a more resilient, inclusive, and sustainable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, uh, the pandemic, I think, has illustrated better than nothing else how connected we all are and how vital it is for us to work together to create that better, more resilient future for ourselves and our planet that we all aspire to. We are very fortunate here in Canada to have a vibrant and dynamic civil society, and there's no better example of that than in Manitoba and this great uh, event today in the participants online. You have the opportunity this week and, of course, throughout the year to engage the public in ways that are 
really in tuned and tailored and sensitive to their needs, their understanding of international assistance and how they can be involved. So I continue to encourage you to remain uh, very inclusive and, and broad in your approach, conscious to meaningfully engage with members of perhaps some more marginalized communities and new partnerships with various sectors of activities that can bridge gaps that exist uh, and access new opportunities uh, at every uh, phase of your different projects and undertakings. IDW uh, is a unique opportunity to engage in dialogue on international development issues and that issues that reach beyond our borders. It allows us to really better understand how global challenges affect different communities around the world. The ongoing pandemic significantly impacted, of course, the livelihoods of many around the world, including here in Canada. So it's important to continue to think how we can adopt and adopt our perspectives as global citizens and how our actions can have positive impact in, as we look to the future. It's really your work, your activities, and your human connection that can call on and create the compassion and international solidarity that's really needed. It's important for us to hear your stories and to put a spotlight on the great work that you do and also the perspective of our neighbors in the developing world. So when it comes down to it, really, I think you provide that vital link that brings the caring, compassion, and curiosity of Canadians together with ingenuity, with courage, and with the knowledge of the people and communities where we work that can help us do a better job at reducing poverty and increasing prosperity and opportunities for everyone around the world. I look really much uh, forward today to hearing from you and uh, listening to this conversation, and I'm happy to be here. So without further ado, thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing what's on your minds. Thank you so much, uh, Stuart. Um, I'm going to ask you to stay um, for our next part, um, and I'm going to now invite representatives of two of MCIC's members to join us in a conversation. So um, Alice Ning Bauma is the Grant Program Manager at World Renew, and Mark Kinzel is the president of Koala Christian Girls School, which is one of our newer members. Um, I think we can all relate to the fact that the last two years have been challenging for all of us as Canadians and also around the world. And it's been very diff different for organizations working in international cooperation as well. COVID has forced a lot of changes on us and our partners in the global south. And I'm wondering, can you tell us about a positive change that has happened with your programming or a way that you've been working differently since the start of the pandemic? And Alice, I'm going to ask you to start. Great. Thanks, Janice. And thank you for inviting me. I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm joining from the territory and treaty, 13 lands, Mississauga of the Credit First Nations. And you know, to answer your question in terms of a positive story, uh, let me start with just providing a bit of context for uh, one of our programs in Honduras, in Tegucigalpa, in the city, and particularly uh, in the neighborhoods of Nueva Suyalpa and Florida Campos. And this particular project is about um, a youth impact club. And you know, the youth and children in, in the city, they're particularly vulnerable. Um, it's very difficult for them to have, you know, basic human rights recognized um, and peace and security and education. There's increasing violence uh, because of uh, drug trafficking and gangs. And, you know, often the children are, are forced to join whether um, if they're victims or even perpetrators. And so uh, World Renew and a local partner association for a more just society, ASJ, uh, we're working with 150 of those at-risk youth and really working in strengthening their protective factors. Um, what I mean by that is building their skills, resources, and support and coping mechanisms um, to deal with a lot of the pressures of poverty and violence. And so we started this program with um, MCIC support. And, you know, we found ourselves um, in the midst of the pandemic and, you know, we're restrictions, it became quite a challenge. Uh, this program is working with youth, um, doing sports events. And so, you know, face-to-face -face interaction in person is vital in terms of connecting um, with the youth. And so uh, partnering with ASJ and their communication departments, 
we're like, we need to uh, pivot to this thing and really look at um, how we would do uh, virtual training, you know, whether recording activities, games, um, using what we could uh, in WhatsApp and recognizing that uh, connectivity and internet, um, you know, it's not always available uh, where, where we might want to. Um, and so, you know, we did that switch um, and really we were concerned and not sure how the children would respond. Um, you know, they're very much um, used to just in person, uh, but we realized that, you know, children and youth, they're, they're highly adaptable and they actually didn't take a lot of time for them to adapt. And in fact, we saw higher participation, especially of parents who were learning about healthy family relationships because they could join. Um, there was more flexibility uh, joining in, in the evening. And so we have seen a lot of uptake in terms of the advocacy work um, that the youth can be involved in. Uh, they were involved in um, advocating for higher quality health care uh, during the pandemic. And a lot of the youth, they drew and they um, created a lot of posters and graphics and posted in their communities about how to uh, follow sort of the public health safety protocols. And, you know, really the youth enjoyed that because they could experience and use their creativity and actually see a change in some of the, the health promotion. And then just maybe one last thing to mention is um, the youth really were engaged in these social audits. Uh, because schools switched to online learning and um, a lot of the youth felt that you know they weren't getting the same sort of attention or response from their teachers and so with ASJ we did an audit they filled out these playful cards um, and they, they were able to assess sort of you know the quality of the education compare with some of their club mates and sort of make their own conclusion about the education they received and you know, we were able to collect a lot of this data and share it with the principals and local education authorities. And you know, soon we heard back from teachers and more feedback, more responsiveness. So it really empowered the youth to say that they could be active citizens um, and their voice did make a difference. So you know, with the pandemic and able to switch this way, um, a lot of positive things have come out from that. Thanks, Alice. Mark, do you wanna tell us uh, what you've noticed or what changes you've seen. Uh, certainly happy to, uh, to do that, Janice. Uh, our background, uh, we are a, a small charity, uh, Manitoba based, and uh, we run a school in Malawi, Africa. Malawi is one of the poorest nations in the world and, and we're in one of the, the poorest areas. So we uh, are exclusive school for girls from uh, very poverty stricken backgrounds. We're a boarding school from a safety perspective. And uh, we're very excited about where we're going. One of the, the things that's happened uh, because of the pandemic, I think for all of us, has been the very rapid expansion of, like this, of Zoom. Uh, who would have been doing this a couple of years ago? Uh, one of uh, the, uh, the grants, which we've been very fortunate to receive from MCIC, had to do with bringing computers uh, to uh, our students. Now, let me set this up for you. Um, our students have never seen a computer before, let alone actually ever operated one before. Yet uh, we've now gone to a position where we have one-to-one -one computers. And with all the changes with Zoom and so on, uh, our connectivity is starting to go way beyond where it was before. Uh, we can have regular updates. And we're now looking at a world where we can bring our students up to speed much more quickly. Uh, we're anxiously waiting for Starlink to come on board in Africa, hopefully sometime uh, later this year. Uh, so that we're going to be in a position, uh, we believe, where we can actually start to bring remote education, remote training uh, into students in uh, this incredibly uh, a poor area. I, I think the other thing that's happened because of, uh, of COVID is the, uh, the need to be resilient, uh, and certainly from the perspective of, of climate resiliency, but also just, uh, you know, you've got to operate on your own. There's some isolation. Uh, this is something where, again, we've introduced more solar. Uh, we're starting to do more things on our own. So I would say the good news uh, from all of this is uh, we've seen uh, better ways of doing things, better ways of being connected, even though we're, we're many miles apart. And ultimately, that's going to provide an opportunity for our students uh, to accelerate in terms of their learning. Our ultimate goal is to have students leave and to become leaders in their communities. And I think every time we can advance the type of education we're giving them, 
uh, we are going to accelerate their skill set and their ability to be leaders. So we're very excited about it. And I think there, there is a, a bit of a silver lining in terms of uh, what we've all been uh, painfully going through. And I hope it's over soon. Uh, but uh, it's, it's really, I think, uh, moved us faster than we would have moved without it. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, Stuart, um, what have you witnessed from your perspective? And, you know, I think you were probably in Haiti when the pandemic started. Um, I don't know if you want to talk from that perspective or from global affairs. Yeah, um, I was in Haiti when the pandemic struck. And, and what struck me was how quickly people were able to um, uh, create new ways of, of, of continuing to try to uh, advance their um, support and help for and collaboration with local communities there to continue the work that different projects were undertaking. And I was very impressed by the degree to which uh, innovation became even more a part of the things that uh, uh, so many partners do. And I, I hope that we on the government side have been able to uh, do a bit along the way as well. Uh, we certainly learned a lot of lessons and we've uh, been challenged to try to be more adaptable and flexible in terms of supporting uh, partners in the projects. And I think some of you have seen some of what we call the COVID flexibilities in action vis-a-vis -vis, uh, funding and extensions and that sort of thing. But, and of course, the department supports innovation in international uh, development assistance uh, in, through very dedicated and specific programs. I believe the MCIC is involved, for example, in FIT, and some of your, your members may be benefiting from that. So um, a lot has, uh, has been uh, done and uh, has evolved uh, similar to the previous uh, interlocutors. Uh, we've had to readapt and adapt to doing things virtually and, and at distance, and that has, uh, in ways, uh, I think, empowered our local partners even more which I think has been a very positive evolution in our development assistance. And of course, uh, uh, overall, the, in the department, we continue to challenge ourselves to try to manage and deliver assistance in a way that ensures greater responsiveness, effectiveness, transparency, and accountability to Canadians. So I think uh, hand in hand with our, our partners in the Global South, we are uh, able to find new ways of achieving common objectives. And uh, I think the panelists uh, that spoke before me demonstrated that very uh, ably in their examples. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so maybe if we think the theme for International Development Week this year is go for the goals. And you know, and that's for you know, all countries that need to strive to achieve these goals by 2030. I wonder if you can share one thing that your organization or your partner organization is doing that's making progress on an SDG. And Mark, I'll, I'll start with you. Sure, thanks, Janice. Uh, you know, when I look at the uh, look at the goals, uh, I we obviously are working with regards to girls and education specifically. And one of the uh, the key things that uh, we are really expanding on is uh, we've become a bit of a vocational school. Uh, and we have greenhouses. And so therefore we're able to not only have uh, the uh, high school education that we provide according to the, the, uh, the government, but at the same point in time, uh, we're starting to introduce the ability from an agriculture perspective. Well, that of course uh, addresses things like poverty and food production um, and, uh, and good health. So it's really become something that's, that's growing, uh, pardon the pun, growing out of this that now uh, our students are having an access to not only just a standard education, but uh, an agricultural side of it, the development and the efficient development of food. So using a greenhouse and using drip lines instead of just planting open gardens and what's the effectiveness of that. And those again are uh, uh, skills that they'll be able to take back uh, when they return to their homes, to their villages. Uh, I suspect they'll be able to start to set up small micro operations with greenhouses and so on. This gets to a, a number of the issues, uh, you know, conserving water, uh, addressing poverty, food security. So I think all those things have started to happen. And, uh, and we certainly are now we're seeing that unfold ahead of us. And uh, we're starting to really build on that principle as well. So there's just one example. Great. Thanks. Alice? Yeah, related to the SDGs, you know, they're, they're so inclusive, um, but I think one in particular that we're working on is SDG 16 uh, related to 
on promoting peaceful and inclusive societies, um, especially with this program in Honduras, where we've seen um, the cycle of poverty and violence being broken. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to share one story um, of a particular youth, um, Mayor Bellin. And, you know, when she started entering our program, you know, she shared that, um, you know, her, her father had left them at a young age and there are three other siblings that she has. And her mother um, is a domestic worker who needs to leave them um, on Mondays and just comes back on Friday. And so she found herself, you know, staying away from school and getting into alcohol and, you know, the attraction of, of being, you know, part of something inclusive. And so, you know, as, as um, sort of her behavior was become known, then some of her mentors came up to her and said, you know, you really need to join this program because the, the life that you're leading, um, you know, it's, it's something that could be quite destructive and because you're the oldest in your family, the responsibility that you have. And so, you know, just some of those stories are just really powerful saying how lives can be transformed and it is individuals um, that we're working with. And, you know, her mother is, is very grateful saying that, you know, that we were able to help in the time when she couldn't, she needed to be out um, and working. And so um, making sure that, that girls um, and boys are receiving quality education um, also in a way that they could uh, participate and you know do some of these audits. And so we really see um, you know giving a voice to the youth and having a say in sort of what kind of future they want to be uh, for a more inclusive society. Thank you. And we know that global affairs is very much involved in this with the go for the goals as the theme for this year. Um, we're just going to wrap up now and so I'm just if maybe briefly um, if each of you could share, something your organization is excited about for 2022. And I'll let you start, uh, Stuart. Thank you, Janice. Uh, and uh, I was very inspired by the examples that uh, the last uh, you know, round brought out on, on this. For 2022, we're very excited about continuing to uh, work uh, with our feminist intersectional approach to um, responding to the pandemic needs having a new minister in place with his new mandate letter. Some of you may have uh, had the opportunity to listen to him, interact with him when he had a um, session uh, co-hosted by uh, the ICN amongst others um, last week. And he highlighted some of his priorities around um, health and education, which I think should be of interest to the panelists, <laughs> um, climate change, and of course, responding to the pandemic. So these things that excite and motivate us. Uh, we, we're going to be doing this with, again, this unique Canadian value added of a, a feminist approach, but also a human, human rights and intersectional approach. And um, hope that uh, together uh, we're going to be able to address not just, you know, technical things like per capita gross national income, but really empower the poorest of the poor. And for that, uh, work with the most vulnerable and of course, that brings us back to the feminist uh, international assistance approach because women and girls we know tend to be the most vulnerable and are the smartest investments in many ways when, when it comes to development because they invest back into their communities, their families, their their uh, own health and well-being. So uh, we can, we're excited to continue this good work and have this new uh, minister in place with his new uh, set of priorities. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, Alice one thing you're excited about? Yeah, excited about like continuing to unpack the idea around localization um, in international cooperation. I really think the pandemic has uh, challenged us. What does it mean to shift power and responsibilities towards uh, local um, actors and national actors? And, you know, World Renew emphasizes working in partnership for long term and using participatory learning action and helping communities identify some of their challenges and come up with their own solutions. Um, but, and balancing this um, you know, community and the autonomy they have for their own development, um, but also how do we challenge some of the social cultural norms, uh, things that we see in sort of machismo or patriarchal societies where you know, they put the boys first, their education and women having little say and power. Um, so, you know, how to continue to engage in healthy conversations that are 
uh, constructive and mutual. So yeah, Thank continuing you. those things. Exciting. Thanks. And Mark. Uh, climate resiliency. Uh, this is something uh, we are, are surrounded by a number of small villages. Uh, we just happen to start to really interact with them. Uh, starting with reading clubs where villagers are coming on Fridays and our students to start to read to them. Uh, then we went ahead in an elders program. Now we start to adopt uh, little villages where we've got elders to secure plots of land. We're doing tree plantings in conjunction with them. And uh, with our step now to we're introducing a, uh, a workshop where we'll be able to produce stoves, uh, you know, so people can get a lot more efficient in terms of the way they cook and, and uh, all this helps from a resiliency perspective. So all those aspects. And, and I just wrap sort of with one story that I think links into this. Um, when we work within, again, our school is surrounded by, by small communities. Most are, are just very uh, basic uh, uh, clay, you know, uh, homes with thatched roofs. And uh, one of the individuals will become an employer. He uh, has become a cook with us. He's learned cooking skills and he's able to generate a regular salary so he could replace his thatched roof with a metal roof. Well, that's also part of the whole process where now people are feeling more positive about themselves. And when we approach them from this idea about looking after the environment and why should you be concerned about planting trees and, and why should you put the effort into that and why should you partner, there's a receptiveness to this. So we're really excited about what we can do in, in our way to uh, help uh, be ready for what's happening right now um, and, and all the changes that are taking place. Thank you. Well, there's so much more we could have talked about because we did talk about some other things when we were planning for this. But, you know, um, we may just have to have a local brews and global views with each of you to um, to showcase more of your work. But um, thank you so much. And I want to uh, now turn it back to Kellen and Lisa. What a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much to Stuart, Janice and Mark Nowis, our uh, representatives from World Renew and Koala Christian Girls School. All right, so coming up, the provincial government through Manitoba Education supports the work that MCIC does with students and educators in Manitoba schools. Today, we are very happy to share a message from Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning, the Honorable Wayne Owasco, who will share some words about International Development Week. Hi there, I'm Wayne Owasco, Minister of Education and Early Childhood Learning for the province of Manitoba. I would like to acknowledge that we here in Manitoba reside on treaties one, two, three, four, and five lands, which are the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Diné peoples, and of course, the homeland of the Métis Nation. It gives me great pleasure to bring greetings today, and I am honored to proclaim February 6th to 12th, 2022, as International Development Week in recognition of the importance of equity, inclusion, and citizenship right here in our Manitoba schools. This proclamation is intended to increase public awareness of the partnerships between civil society organizations, such as Manitoba Council for International Cooperation, the government and community leaders who are addressing social, political and environmental inequalities in our world. This year's theme is go for the goals. The proclamation is further intended to inspire Canadians and youth in particular to learn more about and to actively contribute to global initiatives. Our government supports Manitoba Council for International Cooperation's overseas projects through the Manitoba Government Matching Grant Program, with $1.2 million assisting 54 projects in 30 countries just last year. It is our hope that the observance of International Development Week in Manitoba will provide educators, parents, and community members with many opportunities to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals identified in the United Nations Agenda 2030. Thank you to the Manitoba Council for International Cooperation for your work to raise awareness. Go for the goals. Okay, thank you for those words. Very appreciate it. Back in December 2021, we put out our first ever call to classrooms activity where we challenged students from around Manitoba to learn about the sustainable development goals, pick one that they were passionate about and redesign our $20 Canadian bill based on that SDGs. And let me tell you, Callan, these designs did not disappoint. We had over 70 submissions and it was such a privilege to go through all of them. We had designs featuring notable Canadians and others highlighting very current and important global issues uh, many of which focused on climate action. 
The hardest part of the call to classrooms activity was choosing the winners. We've chosen winners representing grades seven, eight, and nine, who you'll hear from momentarily, but we also want to share some other amazing submissions too that you can check out on our website. We also want to give a shout out to all of the teachers for fostering IDW in their classroom and helping us put together this video. This sounds like a really cool mm -hmm. project, so I'm super excited to see, and let's take a look. My name is Marco Pereira. I am in grade seven, and I go to John Pritchard Middle School. My name is Aiden, and I'm in grade eight. I'm currently attending to Ecclesalt Point School. My name is Emily. I'm in grade nine, and I go to Murdoch McKay. So my name is Ayo Taratia Motasho. I'm from 7M, Ecclesalt Point School. For my design, I chose SDG 13 because not many people know about it. So I chose two bright colors. So I kind of wanted it to stand out. We're not really doing anything about climate change. So that intrigued me to choose that. In my opinion, quality education takes the place at the center of any topic. I believe that beginning to access quality education offers us the possibilities for various SDGs to be achieved. The design I featured is a Canadian pioneer in education, Kate Henderson. Henderson can be credited as a person who consistently improved the quality of education in her pursuit of exploring educational practices. I chose the SDG Climate Action because I think it is very important that we are taking care of our planet and educating ourselves on how to help make it a better and safer place. My design includes many things that represent climate action. For example, I added the recycling logo and a green building. Why I chose life in the water is, was because I feel like sea creatures are really the major concern and you're not really paid that much attention to. So for my $20 bill, I split it in half and the bottom shows what the ocean currently looks like. It's currently a dump site and fishes are dying. And the top shows what the ocean should look like. The fishes shouldn't have to worry about and sea creatures shouldn't have to worry about being stuck with man-made plastic. Well, the goal, I think, of my drawing was to kind of like remind you what could happen if we make the wrong choices. So when you're buying something, you might buy something better off. I think the most important thing we can do is to continue broadcasting the importance of this SDG and keep encouraging people to improve on trying to help our planet. If my $20 bill was printed for use, I think the impact on the public would be every single time people look at a $20 bill, you're going to see what you're doing to the creatures and how they have to struggle every day. I hope my $20 bill could impact us, including myself, to acknowledge the people like Kate Henderson, in addition for us to be aware of the importance of the quality education as it is a powerful weapon which can be used to change the world. Wow, some amazing work from local classrooms. It's always so exciting to see how engaged youth are about international issues. It's one of the best parts of our job. Um, we actually have a message from Councillor Janice Lukes of Waverly West Ward. So she says, our banknotes represent our vibrant, prosperous Canada, the diversity of our society, our culture, and our achievements. Above all, they promote our values and represent the future we are pursuing. Looking at the design submitted by South Point School students for the International Development Week, I can tell you that the future is bright. What I see in the works of these students is respect for our environment, believing in, in equality and inclusion, and re reiterating the importance of education. You make me proud to be Canadian. You make me confident of a promising tomorrow. What great words, and I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and we were blown away by these ideas, and we were so happy to share with them, uh, share them with you today. So you can check out our website and our social media for more information on these amazing designs. Great. Okay, so now we are going to pass things over to Christina McIsaac, who is the director of innovation for the Fit program, and uh, she's going to give us a Fit update. So take it away. Christina. Great. Thank you, Kellen. 
Um, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to give uh, to say a few words about the FIT program and to highlight um, some of the stories coming out of our our funded innovations. So, as many of you on the call might know, um, the Fund for Innovation and Transformation, or FIT, is part of a $100 million Global Affairs Canada initiative announced in 2017 to support Canadian small and medium-sized organizations, or SMOs, um, with funding um, for innovation testing and building capacity in the sector. MCIC was selected to manage the National FIT program on behalf of the Intercouncil Network, of provincial and regional councils for international cooperation. And the program was launched uh, in 2019. So FIT has two main mandates. Uh, first, we provide funding to SMOs and their partners in the Global South to test innovative solutions that aim to advance gender equality, empower women and girls and vulnerable communities. And when we refer to testing projects, of course, we mean short funding timeframes where SMOs need to collect data or evidence to prove their hypothesis. And FIT doesn't fund the implementation of projects. And our second mandate um, is to share the stories and the learnings from our funded SMOs to help build capacity in the sector. So we're pleased to share that FIT is now completing its third year of a five-year mandate. And to date, 42 SMOs have received funding in our first four intakes. And um, testing is taking place in 30 countries throughout the Global South. Uh, the program aims to support a minimum of 50 SMOs with 11.2 million in dispersed funding. And we're on our way. Um, of the funded SMOs, there's representation from across Canada, um, there are a variety of organization types, sizes, languages of work, and SDG themes represented. Um, SDG 5, gender equality, of course, is a core focus of many of our SMOs. There are four organizations from Manitoba that were selected for funding to date. Uh, one um, was Kids Initiative, Make Music Matter, St. Mary's United Church, and IDE Canada. Our fifth intake is underway, um, so please stay tuned as we announce funding recipients later in the spring. And as some of our funded SMOs have completed their testing, you'll start to see more of their results and stories shared on the website and in social media, and we invite you to follow us and to learn some more. So to give you an idea of some of the innovative solutions being tested with FIT funding, we're highlighting two SMO testing projects. The first is Make Music Matter, who will bring, um, who's bringing music therapy to survivors of conflict and trauma in the DRC, and is testing their program on men in the community for the first time. And after, uh, you'll see the video of Cause Canada, who are working toward eradicating child marriage in Sierra Leone. And they're focusing um, for the first time on the demand side of marriage, which includes men and leaders in the community to help, uh, help with this cause. Uh, so over to you. My name is Wendy Fair. I'm the Executive Director at Cause Canada. Cause Canada is an international development and relief organization working in rural communities in Guatemala, Honduras, and Sierra Leone. Our innovative solution is looking at child marriage in Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, child marriage is a huge issue. Over 40% of all girls are married before the age of 18, and 13% of them are married before the age of 15. The focus of the innovation is to be working with men instead of working with some of the more common people that we would work with or that other organizations have worked with on ending child marriage. Child marriage is focused on the socioeconomic benefits of, of marrying young girls. However, over the long term, we know that that's actually very, very detrimental for the family. So what we're going to do is, is actually work with men to help them understand why it's better to wait until girls are older to marry them. This is an issue for sure of gender-based violence, but it contributes to, to gender-based violence throughout the country. It is extremely limiting to women's ability to participate in their society, in their communities, and it just really, really limits their ability to participate in development. 
certainly laws are important and policy reforms are important, but at a community level and at a very local level, we also have to help families to be healthier and help, help women and families and men to stop the violence that's so prevalent in their communities. Hi, my name is Darcy Adaman. I'm the founder and CEO of Make Music Matter, located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Ottawa, Ontario. Our innovation is the Healing and Harmony Music Therapy Program, which seeks to reduce trauma for vulnerable populations living in conflict or post-conflict zones, in particular, the reduction of PTSD, anxiety, and depression. What we're uniquely offering in this particular project is the inclusion of men in a rural community in the Democratic Republic of Congo called Mulamba. What we hope to achieve in this project is not only reduce the trauma of the men in the community, but therefore reduce the collective trauma and hopefully cohere a more positive masculinity community-wide and have men and women come together as equals in the decision-making process. participants themselves write and record those songs, they are in fact creating their own treatment pathway. Since they are the spark for the songs, therefore they have agency over their treatment pathway. And that instills empowerment right from the beginning and I think is very unique. By reducing PTC, anxiety and depression through healing and harmony, all these other interventions that are offered throughout the NGO community are better served and better received. Okay, thank you, Christina. Uh, it's wonderful to see you know more information about these impactful projects. And with that, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. Um, we encourage you to check out our website, mcic.ca for more events and happenings, free resources, sustainability tips, and much more. We also encourage you to check out that contest uh, global affairs put in our chat. Um, don't forget to join us tomorrow for our ID IDW panel discussion, reflections on resilience happening at 7 p.m. And we are also excited to announce that we will be hosting a virtual event with acclaimed local author David A. Robertson on February 28th. He will be doing some readings and discussing his award-winning memoir, Blackwater. So look for registration details on MCIC social, social channels this week. Thank you to everyone who made today's kickoff event possible. We encourage you to take some time this week to celebrate um, Canadians and their contributions to international development. Have a great day okay. and go, go for, for the, the goals. goals.